The Cow Who Escaped the Silo by Eran Segal. Um, since it is the speaker's uh, first talk, we are going to do the DEF CON tradition. But before we do that, I have two announcements. Number one, if you're sitting, please wear your masks. It's, uh, it's required. Um, and the second announcement is please don't loiter or, or sit along the walls or the back. Um, just find yourself a seat. Come on down. Come a little closer and uh, enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to my talk, the, con the container on Windows with Skype the silo. In this talk, I'll demonstrate how a malicious Windows co container image can impact the host it is running on. My name is Iran Segal. I've been in the cybersecurity field for over seven years. Currently, I'm working as research team lead in SafeBridge Labs. My experience involved research on Windows and embedded devices. I'll start with the background of Windows process isolated containers. Then I'll continue with how to gain anti-system inside of the container. After we gained anti-system, I'll explain the method I used in order to find two vulnerabilities that can impact the host. And then we'll talk about them and show a quick demo and we'll finish with Q&A session. So the goal is to find the impact of an attacker crafted Windows container on the host it is running on. I chose this research because containers are everywhere. This attack vector of a malicious Windows container is a real world one and reverse engineering Windows kernel is fun. So let's deep dive into Windows containers. Containers are similar to virtual machines. Each container is created from a container image which contains all the dependencies of the container. For example, the application that the container will run, the file system, OS configuration, registry, and even permissions. The container image contains all the dependencies, therefore it is easy to manage and uh, use it. And just like virtual machines, containers are, are also isolated from the host. Uh, in order to validate that the container won't be able to impact it. it. Windows containers can be deployed in uh, two modes process isolated and Hyper-V isolation, which defines the isolation uh, that they will be executed on. Hyper-V containers are very similar to virtual machines. Each container have its own kernel. The Hyper-V containers can't interact directly with the host kernel, which means that they are more secure, but it comes with computational overhead. Process isolated containers are similar to Linux containers. The entire container runs from the user mode. Process isolated containers interact with the host kernel, but the container is isolated from the host via multiple aspects, which we will focus and talk about them in the next uh, slides. The goal of the isolation is to prevent the container from being able to impact the host. And because the kernel is shared between the container and the host, uh, some uh, validations were added to the kernel to block a container from doing activities that can impact the host. In this presentation, I'll focus only on process isolated containers. When running task lists inside Windows container, we'll see lots of system processes which are related to the OS itself. Unlike Linux containers, which doesn't contain any system processes inside of it. And the reason lies in the differences between Linux kernel architecture and Windows kernel architecture. Both Linux and Windows containers are running from the user mode only in order to validate that they won't be able to impact the host. 
Linux kernel is monolithic. Therefore, all its basic functionality is implemented in the kernel. Unlike Windows, which some of its functionality is implemented in the user mode, while other is in the kernel. Therefore, Windows containers contain system services such as SVC host. So let's deep dive into how process isolated containers are implemented. There are two uh, parts for Windows containers. The engine, which manages all the containers, loads them. As you might know, Docker engine, and the second part of the operating system of the Windows, which is responsible for the isolation of the container from the host. And we will focus only on the Windows part. When an, a new Windows container begins, it creates the environment required for the container, for example, the file system of the container, object namespace, and job object, and of course, the processes that are going to run inside of it. Windows container isolation is separated into three parts job objects, namespaces, and layers. I'm going to focus on bypass the kernel isolation of the job objects. So let's focus on what are job objects. Job objects were created in Windows a long, long time ago to group processes as units and manage the resources, for example, manage the, res the CPU time, memory limits, and so on. But in order to support isolation as well, the job object is required to be converted into silo. Silo object provide basic isolation, but it is not enough for containers, which require much more. So in order for a silo to have all the capabilities required to support containers, it must be converted into server silo. So any server silo is also a silo. After we converted our silo into server silo, which support redirection of resources, now we can use the process, now the processes inside of the container can use object manager, registry, network stack that were loaded from the container image and not from the host. But this isolation is not enough because the container can interact directly with the kernel. So, some validations uh, is required to be added uh, in the kernel itself. So let's understand how the kernel block uh, dangerous syscalls. So if a container does a uh, uh, dangerous syscall, for example, loading driver that can impact the host, um, the, uh, the kernel won't be able, won't allow this activity. And as you can see in the slide, it's validate if the process, the thread that did the syscall is inside server silo, which means that it is inside of a container. Let's deep dive into how it detects it. When the kernel needs to detect that the current pro process is isolated as a container, it checks for server silo or silo in the E thread or E process structs, which are the structs that represent the process and threads. The kernel needs to check all the job objects which attach to the thread or the process uh, because it is possible to attach multiple job objects to a single thread or process structs. Another example of a flow in the kernel which requires to validate if the process is inside of the container or not is a flow of the process list. In this flow, the kernel just skips the processes that are outside of the container. And because of that, when a process inside of the container query for all the process list, it gets only the processes that are inside of the container. So before we try to break out of the container, we need to know uh, if, uh, if we are running inside of the container. Using a single task list command, I'll show you how to detect if we are running inside the, co if the container 
and with which isolation method we are using. It is possible to detect that the process is running from Hyper-V container by listing all the processes and checking if the process CXX SVC exists. Docker D must not exist on the task list and CXX SVC must run from session one. Similar to Hyper-V isolation, it is possible to detect process isolated containers with all the first uh, condition, but the last one, the third, the session ID of CXX SVC must not be one. So after we understood that we are running inside of the container, let's check if we are totally isolated from it. When I began my research, I found a couple of indications that containers are that isolated from the host. These methods are trivial but important for our understanding. The process IDs inside of the container and outside of the container are the same. In the slide, you can see that the process and uh, the PID of CXX SVC inside of the container is the same as outside of the container. When looking and comparing all the other ones, we will see that they are the same. I guess it can lead us to side channel attack between two containers by knowing the ideas, but it is doesn't valuable enough. I, I want much more. So I continue to research. When running a container as container user, uh, I noticed that Proc Explorer, which running outside of the container, doesn't detect the user container user, but it did detect all the other system processes that are running inside of the container, which raised the question, why we have system uh, processes inside of the container and do, do they have the same permissions as system uh, processes outside of the container? So basically system permission, uh, system uh, processes inside of the container have almost the same permissions but if there are isolation checks, as I showed you before, uh, we can't do that. So we need to find a way to bypass that. Uh, so before we jump to how to escape the container, let's gain system permissions. When running docker run command with the user flag of container user, which is a weak user, uh, I would have expected that we will run only container user which weak processes. But if you will see the boot process, lots of system processes are starting from the container image. The only process running as a con the user we defined is the CMD which we executed. Which means that our process can communicate with system uh, processes. And more interestingly, these processes are loaded from the container image which we control. So if we can control the executables, we can gain anti-system. So it doesn't matter with which users the container will run, we can get system permissions. But how exactly can we do it? In order to craft a container image that will run as system always, we need to follow just these four steps. First, run the container as system to add our backdoor inside of it. Then we will create a service that will run as system. We will start it and convert the container into container image that we can deploy in uh, for future use. But this method is not the only one. It is possible to do it with much more than this method. Uh, for example, we can override system 32 executables that are found in the image, use DLL side loading, and modify the configuration, the registry, and even changing the permissions of the container user to have administrator permissions. 
So we gained system permissions inside of the container. But we can't do anything we want yet because we are blocked. We can't load DLLs, uh, drivers, sorry, and we are isolated from the host. We, we can't access the file system. So in order to break the, uh, the isolation, we need to learn first about past vulnerabilities. I'm going to explain two examples of past container escape vulnerabilities. Each one of them represents a different method to look for in container escape vulnerabilities. The first method to look are APIs that Microsoft just forgot to block them from the container. Unit 42 found a vulnerability in object manager symbolic link that let process inside of the container access any hard drive they want. Um, the second method is to try to bypass Microsoft mitigations. James for sure found a way to bypass the kernel validation of the server silo by creating a new silo object which is not a server silo. Microsoft added the support for containers after most of the kernel was implemented. Therefore, I, I chose the first method to look for syscalls that Microsoft just forgot to block. I didn't put a lot of effort trying to bypass existing mitigations and validations. It looks much harder and less cost effective. So, in my research, I looked for vulnerable syscalls but there are over 500 one. Uh, it is not possible to go over all of them manually. So I had to find, n to narrow this uh, attack vector into much better and more interesting functions. So as I said before, it has to be a syscall because otherwise we can't interact with it. The second, this syscall must not have isolation checks, which means that Microsoft may or may not forgot to add the isolation check. And the third one is tricky. If the, the syscall must require system uh, permissions, the higher the privileges, the better. Then it assured that the impact of the syscall will be major info leak or let us impact the host drastically. After I built this recipe, my life became much easier and I began to find vulnerable functions. I did a quick triage of syscalls that match the pattern and the syscall antiquary system information caught my attention. This function contains a huge switch case over the parameter system information class, which is an enum that contains about 200 options. I could not go over all of them uh, manually. So, but luckily I had symbols. I knew which one does what. So I wrote a small code, go over, go over all the interesting ones, and I found an interesting option. If I called the, the system call with the enum value of system handle information, it returned to me a list of all the handles and addresses of the objects from all the processes on the host. It is not possible to use these handles or addresses uh, because we can't open process, uh, pr uh, processes that are outside of the container. And we can't also duplicate that. So what I found is a minor info leak. Uh, we can gain all the process IDs on the host but I want much more so I continue to look. Additional interesting syscall that matched the pattern was anti-system debug control which sounds much better. Anti-system debug control is similar to the previous function. It is huge and enumerate over the enum sys debug command. The this is called, called multiple interesting functions. For example, enable kernel debugger. Um, but all these options were disabled if the kernel debugger is not enabled. If uh, even enable kernel debugger requires that. But all of them except two. User uh, dump, 
which won't give me any actual value because I need a handle to user mode to a process that I can open only processes inside of the container and kernel dump. That sounds much interesting. So let's understand how to do kernel dump using this syscall. In order to do kernel dump, I need to fill the struct sysdebug live dump co com control, which contains two interesting variables handle to a file, easy, and flags to the dump, which specify what the dump will contain in the kernel. I took a source code from the internet that triggers the kernel dump, change it a bit, and now I can dump kernel, uh, the entire, entire kernel from inside the container. But let's understand what I can dump. So the flags that control which information will be included in the, in the kernel dump are listed here. They are undocumented. And the most interesting ones are dump Hyper-V pages and user space memory pages because of LDAS. I attach VM kernel debugger and I try to do a kernel dump from inside of the container and it worked. I managed to dump all user processes and including LDAS on the host. But on a clean Windows machine, dumping user mode is not possible. And the root cause, again, is that kernel debugger is not enabled. All the other flags worked as expected without kernel debugger. So I can dump the entire kernel. I can dump additional pages, uh, but I can't dump the user mode processes. So, but I still want to access passwords on the host. So let's understand how to access them. There are multiple ways to access passwords on the host without LDAS. The first one is via the command line. The kernel dump contains all the information about all the processes on the host, including the command line argument. So if you pass a password in the command line argument, all the environment value variables on the process, so I can access it from inside the container. Another way that sometimes passwords are stored in the registry, which we can also access using the kernel dump. And if the kernel debugger is enabled, it is possible to dump LSS directly and access all, its, uh, all the passwords from in. And of course, kernel dump con uh, from inside of the container can discover much more. It can discover which EDRs and security products are running on the host, uh, event on Windows, st uh, stack traces, kernel memory, and much more. So additional vulnerability I found is related to the UEFI. So in order to understand the impact and how can we use this vulnerability, I'll give a bit of background. When we boot a new Windows PC, it probably boot in this following sequence. First, the UEFI in its CPU loads the UEFI device and drivers. Then, the UEFI loads the configuration from the NVRAM memory in order to know how to continue the boot. Then, the execution forwards from the UEFI to the Windows. On the third step, Windows begins the boot sequence. Windows pulls the configuration from BCD, which are stored in the EFI partition. Then it continues the rest of the boot until Windows completes the boot. Let's focus on the NVRAM storage. The UEFI NVRAM contains the configuration of the UEFI. These configurations are not stored on the hard disk itself, but on a chip in the motherboard. This memory is, not, is shared between the operating system and the UEFI, and there are multiple namespaces in the NVRAM. So in order to access a specific variable there, we need to know its GUID, its namespace, and the variable name. Two examples of major variables are found are boot and boot order. 
boot is a variable that defines the UEFI, how to boot using a specific method. For example, boot from hard disk or boot from CD. Um, the content of the boot variable sometimes point to a files on the hard disk, but they are stored in the UEFI partition on the fetch 32. So the container can't access them, so we can't modify them. The boot order defined in which order the UEFI will try to boot, whether it's going to try to boot from the CD first, hard disk, network, and so on. There are multiple uh, types and flags for the NVRAM variables, which can be classified into two sections. Storage method, which defines whether the NVRAM variable is going to be volatile or not, and the access, when we can access the variable, whether we can access it only on the boot or we can access it on the OS part from the Windows itself. So let's jump to the vulnerability itself. This vulnerability is related to multiple syscalls, uh, which all are related to the NVRAM. So the first capability we want is listing all the NVRAM variables on the host. We can do that using the syscall NT enumerate system and var value, which let us discover all the NVRAM variables from the host, uh, but it is possible to do that from the container itself. But this operation won't be useful without reading them, which leads us to the second syscall, anti-query system environment value, which let us read a value from uh, of a specific NVRAM variable, which is stored on the host. Microsoft didn't block this syscall from the container as well. And the last capability we need is to re and write NVRAM variable, which means that we have read, write, and listing all the NVRAM variables. So it raised the question, what we can we do with it? After the container is killed and start over, sometimes the storage is reverted, which means it is not possible to store permanent data. Writing and reading NVRAM will let us store persistent storage that will store between container reboots, even reboots of the host. And because NVRAM is stored on the motherboard itself, we can even stay after formats. Additional impact is communication between two containers, isolated containers. Because both, both of the containers can read and write from the same memory variables on the NVRAM, we can exfiltrate data between them. And the most interesting impact is triggering permanent denial of service of the host. Because the UEFI parses the NVRAM variables, it is possible to change some of them to make the host unbootable forever. Changing the variables boot and boot order, which we talked about before, uh, doesn't prevent the UEFI from booting Windows because of backup configurations which we cannot touch. Therefore, I had to look for other flows and variables. Another NVRAM variable exists on some UEFI is HDDP. Writing non-valid uh, non value to it will do the job and it will cause permanent denial of service to the host. The, him, the impact of uh, this writing will, be, will happen only after the host restart itself. It will shut down as expected. Everything will work perfectly. And when the host will try to boot up again, it won't be possible. The UEFI won't be able to pass the execution to the Windows part. So it doesn't matter how much restart you will do to the machine, to the host, it won't, it won't start. The impacted UEFI was VMware UEFI. So if we will run Windows container inside Windows VM, 
running in Windows machine, for example, ES6 or VMware Workstation, the UEFI of the Windows VM is a vulnerable component. When writing the HTTP variable from the container, it will cause permanent denial of service to the VMware VM. Sadly, the host machine won't be impacted on. So let's deep dive and understand the root cause. The UEFI built from multiple parts. The vulnerable part is BDS driver, which is responsible for selecting which device to boot from. The root cause in the BDS DXC is that it reads the HTTP variable, and because it is invalid, it called to assert EFI error. This function stops the boot sequence and causes the UEFI to loop, to, to cause a loop, enter into loop that it won't be possible to enter into, or trigger a breakpoint which no debugger will be attached to it, so the UEFI will stop. Which means that the boot sequence will stop and it won't be possible to do it. So let's jump to a demo containing a chain of vulnerabilities. We'll do the privilege escalation using a malicious Windows container and how we can cause a permanent denial of service to the VMware VM. So here, so here you can see a container uh, that we are about to start, which will run with weak privileges with a malicious, and it will load a malicious Windows container. So you can see that the user doesn't have admin privileges, but there is the background service that I created before, and it reads and writes to the input file and output file. So we wrote the who am I command and we will read, read the output and we can see that we have system. And if we will write, override the HTTP variable of the NVRAM, it is possible to say that we override that by six time A. So now only uh, what we need to do is wait for the restart. So you can see that it will restart as expected, no special actions, uh, Windows won't detect that as an issue. And once it will start up again, the Windows part won't be able to boot. The UEFI will just be stuck on that. So here is the UEFI start in its resources, and when it will continue, that's it we won't pass this, this step. So let us explain how the demo worked. So before the demo, I created a malicious Windows container contains a vector service that runs as system. It read and write from the input file and output uh, file. And when we executed using this service, uh, the NVRAM executable, which overwrites the HTTP uh, variable and restarted the machine, we triggered the de permanent denial of service. So let's jump to mitigating the, this. It is not easy to mitigate these vulnerabilities without official patch for Microsoft. But there are few workarounds that we can do. For example, instead of using process isolated containers, which are easy to use and doesn't have overhead of computational power, we can use the Hyper-V isolation, which costs more in performance, but it is not vulnerable to the UEFI and the kernel dump, uh, vulnerabilities. Another flow is to run only signed executables, which you can trust and therefore you won't fear of malicious window, uh, Windows containers, but it's really hard to do that. And another one 
is to assume that container image will run a system and use it in the topology, the network topology. Container image scanning is used in order to ensure that no such issues, such as privilege escalation in the Windows container, uh, exist on the container. So I tested my container with the privilege escalation and I could, they didn't detect that. But only after I dug into their website, I discovered that they don't support Windows container officially but they did mark the container as clean. So if you are using container images and you scan them, please assure that the product is support Windows containers. Sadly, I could not put my hands on the Windows container image scanning product that support Windows containers. Regarding the vendor response, Basically, Microsoft said that because administrators can start containers, the privilege escalation that we can gain anti system inside of the container is not a vulnerability. Regarding the kernel dump, that we can dump uh, the kernel from inside of the container, they re uh, answered that it is not a vulnerability because we need administrator user inside of the container which we gained in the privilege escalation. But they do plan to fix it in the future. Regarding the open NVRAM syscalls, which we can write, read, and list NVRAM variables, Microsoft defined this uh, attack as moderate denial of service, which is outside of the Windows security update, but they will fix it. And regarding the Vimer UEFI uh, HTTP, which caused the permanent denial of service to the host. Vimer treats it as functional issue because it impacts the, uh, only the VM itself and requires admin privileges uh, from inside. But they do plan to fix it in future releases. I uploaded all the tools and modifications that I used. Uh, how to do privilege escalation and create a, mali uh, a malicious Windows uh, container to GitHub. In addition, in this repo, you can see uh, you can use the code that does the kernel dump from inside of the container and manual to how to, go, uh, to cause permanent denial of service to Vimer uh, VM. Uh, so some acknowledgments. I would like to thank Mickey for helping me reversing the Vimer UEFI and additional researchers that I based my research on top of theirs. Thank you for joining. The Q&A will be happening there. Um, so thank you.